I often get asked in this, what are the biggest bang for buck actions that you can take to take control of your lubrication program? I really think it comes down to three things, contamination control, lubricant selection, as well as personnel training. Now I'm gonna do this as a three part series. And so today we're gonna concentrate on contamination control. And ultimately contamination control is pretty simple. But one of the areas where I think we slip up is that most people's understanding of lubricants and lubrication comes from engine oils because that's where most of our experience is, right? Most of us experience changing oil on our car and that's usually the first time we interact with some kind of lubricant. Now what's the problem with that? Well, engine oils are kind of different from all the other lubricants. The engine oils are designed to accumulate all the trash that is the result of combustion. So the soot byproducts and the acids that are formed as a result of combustion, engine oils are designed to really hold them together using detergents and dispersants until we have an oil change. Industrial lubricants work a little bit differently. They are generally designed to separate out the trash, right? So we generally have like a large reservoir where things are allowed to settle down to the bottom. And let's say, for example, if we have water contamination, we can then drain that water off. So it's a slightly different philosophy. With industrial lubricants, particle and water exclusion is way easier to achieve than filtration. So if we can exclude contaminants in the first place, that's gonna make our lives so much easier. Now, first of all, let's talk about particulates. Now, Vickers, for example, says that targeted cleanliness eliminates the root cause of about 80% of hydraulic system failures. Now, you'll recognize that 80 as something from the Pareto principle, that 80-20 rule where we say that 80% of failures are down to a select number of causes. In this case, contamination of hydraulic oil. SKF says a similar thing about bearings where basically bearings are designed to live forever. We actually murder bearings in some senses by contaminating them. So the first kind of particulates, so the first kind of contaminants that we're going to talk about are particulates. Now particulates are reasonably easy to understand, right? It's physical matter that is causing erosion or some kind of abrasive wear. But why is it actually so important in lubricated components? Well, if we think about hydrodynamic lubrication, this is what we call thick film lubrication. But that thick film is not very thick at all. In fact, it's on the region of about, you know, five to 40 microns. And that happens when we have sliding action between two surfaces. So you've got to think that any kind of contaminant that is in that order of magnitude, in that sort of micron range, is potentially going to be damaging to those surfaces. Now, elastohydrodynamic lubrication is something that we see where there's rolling motion between two relative surfaces. That's something that's a feature of something like bearings, cams, or gears. Now, in those instances, the lubricant film is even smaller. It's usually in the order of about a micron. Now, just for reference, a hair is about 75 microns thick. I'm obviously not an expert in that, but blood cells are about 25 microns, a white blood cell, and the detection limit on the ICP is about eight microns. So what is interesting about this and a little bit counterintuitive is that invisible contaminants are actually the most dangerous because they're on the same order of magnitude as the lubricant film thickness. The good news for us is that particulate exclusion is actually relatively simple. When I have to explain it in the most simple terms, it's put lids on stuff, right? So when you open a drum, make sure you close it. When you have dispensing containers, make sure you wipe off the spout, make sure that they're sealed. Um, you've probably seen like oil safe containers. They do a really good job for that kind of purpose. When you are lifting the lid off a reservoir, make sure that you close it. Make sure that you have this over the top of your reservoirs as well. Don't leave them open to atmosphere. The same applies when you're taking samples. Don't leave the lids off the bottles because stuff will just blow in. Most of the time, we're not working in clean rooms. The exception would be maybe the pharmaceutical business. But in most of our industries, like mining or oil and gas or the quarrying business or cement, we're usually working in really dusty environments. So anytime we leave anything open, dust and particulates is getting into our system and ultimately it's damaging our equipment. Now, the second form of pernicious contamination is of course water. Now, water is in some ways a little bit more difficult to exclude than particulates because by definition, the molecules of water are a little bit smaller. So for example, sealed drums are actually not completely watertight. Something that a lot of people don't appreciate is that they heat up and cool down over time, right? So particularly if you store them outdoors, in the sun, the oil inside heats up, it forces air out the bungs, and when things cool down overnight, if you have a layer of water on top of the drum, that can actually be sucked in by the vacuum that's caused by the shrinking of that oil. 
As a result, you get a buildup of water and this cycle happens again and again and again every day until you actually have a substantial amount of water in your system. Now, water is a bad contaminant for a number of reasons. It causes viscosity alterations, it can cause emulsions, it can attract additives, and in the case of ester-based lubricants, it can actually hydrolyze them and break them down into acids and alcohols. So water is extremely dangerous for lubricants. So in the lubricants industry, when we say oil and water do not mix, it takes on a slightly different meaning. But again, there are relatively simple and inexpensive ways to solve this. We can, for example, just store drums inside. Now admittedly, sometimes that's not always possible, but if we do have to store them outside, there are these things called drum hats that you can pick up for like $20. They will mean that if you have any kind of rain, it's actually just gonna hit the ground. Now in some certain humid environments, you've gotta be wary of condensation buildup underneath them, but still, it's a much more effective way of excluding water. Another way that's really simple is to store them on their side. Make sure that the bungs are at kind of the nine and three o'clock position and you shouldn't have any issues. Another thing to do if we have to store them outside, store them at a slight angle, put a chock underneath. That'll mean that any water which ends up on the lid ends up at the low side and can't be drawn through the bungs. Another very quick tip is to make sure that these are stored off the ground. And again, that's really easy to do with something like a pallet. All that that's gonna mean is that you're not gonna get any kind of rusting in the bottom of the drum that could potentially rust through and cause something like an oil spill, right? So again, very easy and very simple. When it comes to oil reservoirs, we know that they breathe as well, right? As the oil inside expands and then contracts, the oil level is going up and down and that's obviously forcing air both in and out of the reservoir or the headspace. Now, with that comes humid air and Obviously, humid air is saturated with water. So one thing that we can do is, of course, place some kind of breather element on. Now, typically, these are just air filters, which are designed for the exclusion of particulates. But I really highly encourage the use of desiccant breathers. Now, again, these can be picked up for the order of like 30 to 50 US dollars or something like that. So it's inexpensive insurance for your system. Ultimately, what they do is they're kind of like those desiccant packets that you get in food, and they're just designed to dry the air on its way in. I'd encourage you to spend a little bit of extra money on getting one that has one-way valve. It just means that you're not drying the air that's actually leaving the reservoir, because we don't really care about that air, right? The final kind of contaminant, other lubricants. And this is really a matter of educating your workforce that not all lubricants are the same. Now, I actually have a separate video on how to do color-coded tags, but a tagging program is one of the easiest ways to make lubricant top-ups more or less idiot-proof. And it doesn't need to be some kind of radically complex system. All you need is a system that can be posted in the lube room and that everyone understands. And these can be really, really basic. You basically just divide a square into a whole lot of areas, name the type of lubricant in use, maybe the ISO viscosity, I would say that's probably essential. I personally think that you should name the product. Some people disagree because when you change vendors, then you have to re-tag them all. In that instance, I would just say to the vendor, it's on you to re-tag everything. If you want my business, you'll go through my facility and re-tag everything. You might also wanna put how frequently to do a sample and kind of QR or barcode system if you're a little bit more sophisticated. But again, this is not rocket science. It's really easy to prevent cross-contamination of lubricants. And then once you have a labeling system, just start putting them everywhere. So if you have a hydraulic system, for example, put one on the sampling point and one on the reservoir. If you are bringing in uh, packages, make sure you label the packages so it's very obvious where they go. Give consideration to mobile equipment that's gonna be outside. Make sure that your labels are gonna resist the effects of the sun as well as the rain. And then, particularly for bulk storage, you're gonna have trucks that are coming in and delivering liquid lubricants. We don't wanna have like a 10,000 liter mistake going on. So make sure you label that tank. In that instance, what's important to the driver, what he understands is the product name that's in his tank. So make that one nice and big so it's very obvious to that truck driver what goes where. So ultimately this game is actually pretty easy. For the most part it's put lids on stuff, make sure your lubricants are cool and dry, and then put labels on things. It's really that easy.